you so much. Yeah. Oh, thank you, thank you. Okay, then. Last time they did a little thing back there. No intro today. Well, my son's intro was good enough. And, uh, well, it's such an honor to be with you guys. I tell you, I love this church. I love the spirit in this church. Thank you for receiving my son. And, uh, son, I just want to say I really honor you. Uh, listening to you is one of my favorite things. And uh, I love your heart for people. I love your heart for the kingdom. And uh, I, I want to honor you. So. It's, uh, it's good. You can see he takes after his mother. I'm, I'm good looking, but he's much better looking. That's, if you see his mother, you'll know why. And so, uh, yeah, okay. I'm going to speak to you today about the subject of don't resist the Holy Spirit. Don't resist the Holy Spirit. There's a couple of times in the Bible where, for instance, in Ephesians 4, it says don't grieve the Holy Spirit, which is, always, which is really about hurting the heart of God. When somebody's grieved, they're sad. And uh, so in Ephesians 4, it says, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Um, so grieving is often through the things we say to people. Has anyone ever said something to you, a little bit of a put down, and it just makes you feel bad? And, and it's possible to grieve the Spirit. But then in 1 Thessalonians 5, it's possible to quench the Spirit. So Paul says, don't quench the Holy Spirit. And that's about putting fire on water, the Holy Spirit's activity. So when the Holy Spirit is moving, let him move. Don't pour water on what God is doing. Fuel the fire of the Spirit. But I want to talk to you this morning about not resisting the Holy Spirit. The word resist literally means, in a dictionary definition, to stand in opposition against. Now, just think of the humor of that, by the way. That, that here's the Holy Spirit who's been given to the church to lead us into all truth. That's what Jesus said in John chapter 16. The Holy Spirit has been given to lead us. He will guide you into all truth. But how many of you know sometimes we don't like where the guide is going? Have, have, you, have you ever been one of those, on one of those trips where, you know, you're in an underground cavern or perhaps you're going up a mountainside and the guide says, go this way, and you're looking where he's going and go, I really don't want to do that. I think I'm going to go back down the mountain. And sometimes we're resisting where God wants to take us. And uh, how many of you have ever tried getting kids ready for church? And you've encountered resistance? I can't find my shoes. It's like another 10 minutes just searching for shoes, you know, and the kid has hidden them somewhere. And it's like, you, you tell a five-year-old, hey, we're going to McDonald's, they will be ready in like two minutes. How about, how about going to McDonald's before you come to church? That will get them ready. Hey, we're going to do breakfast at McDonald's before we go to church this morning. It's like, zoom. It's like they're all ready. But, but just resistance. And resistance manifests it, it, its ways in, in different expressions. There's what I call active resistance and passive resistance. So, so let's go through the active resistance. Active resistance is when somebody asks you to do something and you say no. No. And it's like, oh, my goodness. Jesus told a parable of two sons. You know, go and work in my vineyard. First says, yeah, sure. And then he didn't go. And he goes to the second son, go work in my vineyard. No, I'm not going. Walks away, gets convicted, goes and works in the vineyard. Jesus said, who did the will of the father? Do you get it? So not every no is a permanent no. And not every yes means anything. Have you discovered that one in life? Uh, you know, Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no, no. How many, how many of you know that sometimes a yes means a no? It's just they don't have the courage to say it. And, and so there are these different games that we play sometimes. Here's what Stephen said to the leaders of his day. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. I want to tell you that is in your face. It's like right up at this part of the sermon, right up to this part of the sermon. He's been quite nice, actually. But now in this part of the sermon, he's looking at them. And you have to understand, for a Jew, circumcision is a sign of the covenant. It's a sign you're in. You're blessed. God loves you. You're part of his special people. And, and basically what Stephen is saying, you may have physical circumcision, but the circumcision of the heart and the ears, you don't have it. And it's like, whoa. You know what they did after this? They killed him. <laughs> they did not like this message. They stoned him. And he says, 
As uh, you always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did, so do you. How about that? You can have a generational resistance to the Holy Spirit. And we're not talking here about Gentiles and foreigners. He's talking to religious leaders in his day. And so it's possible to have a posture where the Holy Spirit wants to lead you, but you don't want to go where he's leading. Now, how many of you know when the Holy Spirit wants to lead you to do something that you like doing, you're going to say yes? Yeah? So, so if it's a blessing, you know, like if I said to you, like my son said to me, we're going out for a steak dinner. How many of you know it took me like 0.5 of a second to answer that? Like, yes, yes, I love that, you know? But when something is harder, it's harder to say yes. It's, it's, there are things in us that we find difficult. You see, if you're going to be led into all truths, how many of you know that some truths are painful? Yeah? When God is working in your life, one of the things he, he starts to do is to show you what you're really like. How many of you know that's pretty ugly sometimes? It's like, oh, my goodness. You know, if you want to know what you're really like, put you in a difficult situation and see what comes out of your mouth. Oh, too harsh? <laughs> Isn't it true? When life is going well, we're all raising our hands. We're praising God. And then when life gets difficult, it's like Job's wife. I feel sorry for Job. It's like, it's like he lost all of his kids, all of his camel, all of his sheep. Like, he lost everything except his wife. And it's like, can you imagine the demon says, take his wife out. The devil says, no, no, leave her. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> it's like, curse God and die. That was her advice. Curse God and die. Uh, and it's like, you are speaking like one of the foolish women. And it's like, oh, my goodness, sometimes something comes out of us in the pressure of a moment that is in us that you don't see until the pressure comes on. And so I want to explain to you this morning how you can position yourself not to resist the Holy Spirit. Is that good? So, so here's, here's the first one. When you're actively resisting the Holy Spirit, you disagree and you say no. Listen to this. This is Numbers 13. This is the, 10, the 12 spies who've gone out to spy the land of Canaan. Here's, here's Caleb. I like Caleb. Numbers chapter 13. Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. Does that sound like a man of faith to you? I mean, the promise of God, the promised land, God said to us uh, that we're going to inherit this, and it's for us. He says, come on, let's go up and possess it. He, the, but the men who had gone up with him, the other 10, we are not able to go up against the people. They're stronger than we. How many of you know that's resistance? That is coming against... And because 10 of them were in agreement, the power of agreement, they discouraged the heart of the entire nation. The whole nation ended up in a place God did not want them to be for 40 years. Why? Because resistance. Listen, we're meant to resist the devil. That's what James says. Resist, resist the devil and he will flee from you. But we're not meant to resist the Holy Spirit. And how many times has the Holy Spirit been called the devil? <laughs> Too much? Like, whoa, you're just rebuking the enemy. Yeah, that's the Holy Spirit trying to lead you. And sometimes we get it confused. You see, these people, they saw exactly the same thing, but Joshua and Caleb had the promise of God living in their heart. You know, when God was describing the land to them, here's what he said, a land flowing with milk and honey. They came back and they said, it's a land with walled cities and giants. That's a difference in perspective. In other words, God saw the walled cities and the giants, but he was basically saying, that's not a problem for me. There is blessing in that land if you receive my promise. But sometimes, instead of walking by faith, we walk by sight. And walking by faith simply means we take the promise into our heart that becomes a filter for viewing what we see. And we reinterpret the reality that we face in the light of God's promise. That's called living by faith. Jeremiah was another one. He's a prophet of God. A prophet of God. Can you imagine that? A prophet of God resisting God. God he got so disappointed with the way God was dealing with him 
that he, here's what he said. In, this is in Jeremiah 20. Then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. Nada, finito, I quit. In another place, here's what Jeremiah says. You were to me like a stream that dried up on me. That's what Jeremiah said to God. This is a prophet. This is a man who's called, before you were born, I ordained you a prophet. And he's saying to God, I've had it. I've had it with you. And then he goes on to say this. But his word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary of holding it back and I could not. That's the problem. When you say yes to Jesus, it burns in you. You can try and shut up, but eventually it's going to leak. And, and, and Jeremiah, he had to yield. And God spoke to Jeremiah at another time. He said, here's the problem, Jeremiah. You've got to learn to separate the precious from the vile. You've got to learn to eat the chicken and spit out the bones. You've got to learn to make a distinction in your life. Not everything is meant to be swallowed. Not everything is meant to be taken. Not everything is meant to be believed. You've got to start discerning and making a difference. And as a prophet, he had to start doing that. What about this one in, uh, in Acts 13? Here's, here's another one. This is a man who on Pentecost, 3,000 people got saved with Jesus for three and a half years, walked on water with Jesus. And uh, a sheet comes down out of heaven with, with animals in it. And it says this in verse 13. A voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord. Again, just imagine the humor right there. No, Lord. Because Lord means yes. You know, like if he's Lord of all or not at all. So, so you can't have no and Lord in the same sentence. It, the, the only way to respond to Lord is yes. Yes, Lord, or no, thank you. But, but no, Lord, it's like, well, who's in charge here? And three times this happened to him, and a voice comes a second time and says, what well, God has cleansed, don't call common. Here's the problem for most of us. We have frames of reference in our lives. And when God speaks to us within our frame, we're very comfortable. We're comfortable saying yes. We're comfortable following. We're comfortable taking steps of faith. But sometimes our frame of reference is too small. Sometimes it's a theological frame. Sometimes it's a relational frame. And then God does something outside the frame, and suddenly we feel really uncomfortable. And so suddenly God is saying something about Gentiles here, something that Peter is not used to. He's not used to it. It doesn't fit his cultural frame. It doesn't fit his theological frame. God is moving outside of that. And he's saying, no, 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 I don't want to do that. And God is saying, yes, 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 I'm doing something new. I'm doing something bigger. You've got to expand your frame of reference. I want to encourage you, come on, where is God challenging you to expand your frame of reference? Where is, where is he doing something outside of your current frame? And your frame is just not big enough to hold it. You know, Jesus put it like this, new wine needs new wineskins. When God is doing new stuff. So I found that, that when I'm resisting the Holy Spirit, there's just disagreement. It's like, no, and we have excuses. But, but then you can move into accusation. That's kind of next level. And most of the time, when you make an accusation, if you're a Christian, you pose it as a question. Now, I think questions are good. Don't get me wrong. God uses questions all the time in the Bible. But sometimes you're not really asking a question. You're making an accusation. Let me give you a few examples here. Here's, here's, here's John chapter 12. This is, uh, this is Jesus um, being anointed by Mary with precious oil of spikenard. And, and here's Judas' response. Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Doesn't that sound good? Doesn't that sound good? What a good question. Really an accusation. It's like, He's basically saying, what a waste. What a waste on Jesus. And it's like, whoa. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box. And he used to take what was in it. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. Jesus placed a value on what she did because she, she was responding to the Holy Spirit and not resisting him. This meant one year of wages for her. 
one a, a costly spikenard oil worth one year of wages. You think about how much you earn in a year. Could you do that? Could you blow that in one go for Jesus? And that's what she did. And it's like, you got that. And Jesus said, you know what? She's discerned the moment. Wherever this gospel is preached, I want you to talk about this. That's how amazing it was for Jesus. What about this one? Here's one, Eliab. You know, I, I, Eliab, I kind of feel sorry for Eliab. He's the older brother in David's family, the household of Jesse. Because Samuel turns up and he sees Eliab and he says, surely this is the Lord's anointed. You know, and if you're Eliab and Samuel's saying that about you and not one word he says falls to the ground, that's going to make you feel pretty good, isn't it? And then God taps Samuel on the shoulder and says, no, it's not him. And it's like, how awkward is that moment? It's like, and it, you know, and then finally your snotty-nosed little brother who's out keeping the sheep is the one who gets anointed. That annoying little fella. And it's like, oh, my goodness. And so when David goes to see the battle where there's this standoff with the Philistines and Goliath, it says this in chapter 17, verse 28 of 1 Samuel. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, why did you come down here? Now, it's a question, but it's really an accusation. Why did you come here? And what have you done with those left, who have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? In other words, what you do in life is inconsequential. It's a put down. I know your pride and the insolence of your heart. You've come down to see the battle. You know, when people move into accusation, they actually move into projection. In other words, the pride of their heart is what they project on you. And that's what Eliab is doing here. What's he doing? He's resisting the Holy Spirit. He's resisting what God wants to do through his little brother. And David just has one response. Is there not a cause? Is there not a reason? David is not put off by that. David turns away and then speaks to someone else. In other words, he doesn't let the accusation come into his heart. He's following the Holy Spirit. Here's the last one. This is a great one. Um, Moses has led the children of Israel out of Egypt, and they're now facing the Red Sea. So they've got the Egyptian army behind them, the, the, the Red Sea in front of them, and there's a mountain either side. They are trapped. They are trapped. And here's what the people say to Moses, Exodus 14, 11. Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? It's a question, but it's really an accusation. Why have you dealt so with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for we would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness? Oh, can you believe it? The Holy Spirit wants to lead them into freedom. But sometimes in order to lead you into freedom, the Holy Spirit will lead you into a dead end. And it's like, why is that? Well, because God wants you to see how big he is when you're in your dead end. You see, the only way for them to get out of this is for God to open up the Red Sea, and that's exactly what he did. In other words, God showed how big he was by leading to a, them to a place where they had no way forward without God moving on their behalf. Do you get that? Your dead end is a dead end in the natural. It's never a dead end in the spiritual. It's never a dead end for God. Okay, we have a rule in our church. One claps, we all clap. Can we try that again? So much better, thank you. Truth should excite you like this. You see, we talk about the leading of the Holy Spirit and, and not resisting the Holy Spirit. And he's going to lead us into all truth. But sometimes the Holy Spirit is leading me into a place of truth and I don't like it. I don't feel comfortable. I don't feel safe. I feel nervous. I feel insecure. I feel exposed. And the Holy Spirit says, that's okay. You're going to see the bigness of God in that place. <laughs> David says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me. God doesn't deliver you from the valley. He walks with you through the valley. Or one or two there. You know, I, 
Think about it like this. I hear Christians say this all the time. Oh, we just want to see miracles. And, and, and do you realize what you're saying when you say that? God's going to put you in a place where you need a miracle. How uncomfortable is that? It's like, you want to see a miracle of healing? Wow. Watch out. You'll get somebody, you'll get a diagnosis over your life. They say this. Well, what are you going to say? Are you going to stand in a place where he is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, my healer? Uh, and are you going to look at yourself in the mirror and say, I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord in the land of the living? There's what they say and what we say. There's what they say and what the word of God says. And sometimes we want a miracle. It's like, yeah, I don't mind you getting sick and getting a healing. I'll shout about your miracle. Hallelujah. We had a miracle in our church. But who wants to be in the place where they need a miracle? Where you're facing bankruptcy and you need the Lord to come through with finances for you. And, and what about when the Holy Spirit says to you? You know, it was one time I, I was going through New Zealand. I did a whole load of ministry over like a five-week period. I got like the best offerings I'd ever had. I was so happy. And then I was in a meeting where a good friend of mine, um, he was celebrating like 40 years of ministry and he was turning 70. And they, they just said, oh, we're going to take up a special offering for Bruce. And as soon as I heard those words, I wanted to go, la, 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 la. Like, like I didn't want to hear any more because I kind of knew where this was going to go. And sure enough, you know, they said, you know, whatever God puts on your heart, just put in this offering. And the Holy Spirit said to me, Give away half of all your offerings. It's like, oh, oh, did I hear that right? 50%? Oh, can I tithe? <laughs> That's when tithing comes a much better option. <laughs> it's like, oh, and it was like, it was like a moment there. It's like, oh, you know, you know that, that verse, serve the Lord with gladness? Oh. I'm so happy to do this. In Jesus' name. I put the 50% in. And I did feel happy. But but there's this there's this moment, isn't there? Where it's like the Holy Spirit is leading us for our benefit. You see, Jesus said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So the only way to be free is to be led into the truth. But sometimes the truth is uncomfortable. Sometimes the truth is a very insecure place to be. And it's like, you know, who wants to say yes to that? Well, there's a part of you that doesn't. The old man doesn't want to be crucified. The old man wants to protect its rights, preserve its rights, preserve its ego. But God wants you to see how big he is and how powerful the new creation is in you. You know, when we go past accusation, we get into threats. And, you know, sometimes Christians play this game as well. In Acts 4.17, it says this, the religious leaders to Peter and John, so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak no more in his name. I believe the enemy today wants to silence the church. And I, th I think there's a lot of ministers and leaders and church people just feeling intimidated. We are just being intimidated because of the threats that's coming, the threat of being canceled, the threat of losing your job, the threat of this, the threat of that. And, and there needs to be a boldness in us. Peter and John, you know, after they left these, these, these religious leaders, they said, we cannot help but speak about his name. And they went back in Acts 4 and had a prayer meeting. And they said, now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness we might preach the word. And the place was shaken again and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They said, we're not going to bow to this intimidation. And so be careful. And then the next level is violence. And the multitude rose up together against them. This is Acts 16, 22. And the magistrate tore off their clothes. This is Paul and Silas. And they commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. How many of you know sometimes being obedient leads to pain? So because they delivered a girl from a demon, they got beaten with rods. They got stripped naked. And what did they do at midnight? They sang hymns to God. They praised God, and the place where they were was shaken, and their chains fell off, and the jailer got saved, and his household got saved, and a church was planted. 
Come on, God works all things together for good. So, so, so you know, just don't be intimidated. But, but let me focus now on passive resistance. Passive resistance, because I think this is where most of us as Christians are. You know, we're not, we're not generally speaking people who say no up front. We're not genuinely people who, are, who, who, on the whole, accuse, threaten, and use violence. On the whole, we don't do that. And, and if you do, you need help. Can I just say that? You need help. And there's a great team that can help you here. Just admit the truth that you're somebody who just needs deliverance, freedom. But here's how it works. Passive resistance. And I, I call this avoidance. Avoidance. That's the first manifestation of passive resistance, avoidance. Have you ever been ghosted? Nobody wants to confront you. They ghost you. That's passive aggressive right there. Passive resistance. And, and, and sometimes as Christians, we play this game. If we want to passively resist, we'll say something like this. Let me pray about that. <laughs> Have you ever played that game? You already know the answer, but you say, let me pray about that. That's called lying in the Bible. And it sounds good, doesn't it? How about this one? I've, I've played this card so many times. Let me talk to my wife. <laughs> That's such a great one. It's her fault if we say no. You know, let me talk to my wife. You know, I want to play that card. Avoidance. You know the answer, but you don't want to give the answer. So you see, you say, oh, let me, let me think about that. Let me pray about that. And it's like you're playing a game. You're playing a game. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you, but instead of saying no, you, you don't want to say no because that's going to make you look bad. So you just play the avoidance game. It's a passive way of resisting. And, and, and you know, uh, you find it in the Bible in Luke 9. You know, oh, let me first bury my father. You know, let me first, Jesus, let me just, it's avoidance. By the way, in a Jewish burial, it took a year nearly. Six months minimum, but a year. Why? Because when the guy died, you had to put him in the tomb and then wait for the flesh to rot. And then you had to gather the bones and put them in the family crypt. So if you were the oldest son and you were burying your father, you were waiting between six months and a year. Jesus said, don't play that game. You know, let the dead bury the dead. He's not saying don't go to a funeral. He's saying don't wait around for a year for the bones to be ready to go into the family crypt. That's what Jesus is about there. But avoidance. How about this one? The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for its wickedness has come up to be. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and he went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So here's God saying, go east, and Jonah goes west. And, and don't you love the way it's written? Because when you leave the presence of the Lord, your life is going to go down. He went down to Joppa, and then he went down into the ship, and then he went down into the fish, the belly's fish. It's like, that's your life. It's just going to go down when you are avoiding where God wants you to be. And it's like, what did he do in the fish's belly? I love this. He got creative. Now, what do I mean by that? He wrote a psalm. Do you realize in your worst moments, God can speak to you? In your worst moments, God can speak to you, and you can be creative. I love that. That's how kind God is. And eventually, he spits out, and he goes to Nineveh. And it's like that. the whole book is about his desire to avoid and so what does he do? He runs away from God's presence. Now, at that time, where's God's presence? Well, it's in the temple. It's where the priests are. And he runs away from it. That's what people do. They run away from church. And they avoid meeting. Oh, yeah, you know, life's so busy right now. I'm on this course. I'm doing this thing. Well, you know I'm a medic. Well, you know I'm in the military. Well, you know I'm this. It's like... Avoiding, avoiding, avoiding. It's like God's got a purpose he wants you to be involved in. And, and here's what Jonah, here's what upset Jonah. Not that God was going to judge Nineveh, but that he was going to forgive them if they repented. He knew that. 
Here's the second one, reluctance. Reluctance. Have you ever been reluctant to obey the Holy Spirit? How about this one? This is Moses. Moses, who spoke with God face to face as a man speaks to his friend, who wrote the first five books of the Bible. This is Moses. God appears to him in a burning bush. That's fantastic. Wouldn't you like that on your CV? I would love that. And when God appears to him, he says these words to him. He says, Moses, I've seen the affliction of my people. I've heard their cry. I know their sorrow. I've remembered my covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I have come down to deliver them. And if you're Moses listening to that, you're thinking, yay, yay, after 400 years, God is on the move and he's going to do something. Fantastic, God, high five. And then God says these words, come now, I'm sending you. And it's like Moses going, time out. I like the first bit. You know, whenever God is going to come down and do something, he's going to do something with someone. It's always in partnership. And God wants to partner with you. He wants to partner with the church. He wants to use us to do things. And Moses just began to make it about him. And he says this in Exodus 4.10. He said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. You know what? When we're reluctant, we make excuses. Oh, you got the wrong guy. Oh, you know, I'm not qualified. I'm single. I'm married. I have kids. I don't have kids. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough resources. I don't have enough this. I don't have enough that. I'm too young. I'm too old. It's like, what excuse are you using for reluctance? What are you putting on the table? You know what Paul said to Timothy? Let no man despise your youth. You are a man of God and you're called to serve. Let no one despise your youth. I love that. That's an eight-year-old kid who started clapping there. Well done, son. So the Lord said to him, Who made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore, go and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you should say. I love that. God is not impressed with your excuses or your reluctance. Because it's not about you. Paul said it like this. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. It's not about you. It's not about how articulate you are. It's not about how qualified you are. It's not about how experienced you are. It's about God's greatness in you. That the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. It's about His grace in your life. It's about the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. And He's just looking for a willingness. Do you know Jesus is described as the yes and the amen of the Father? Not the maybe, not the let me think about it. The yes and amen of the Father. My meat is to do the will of Him who sent me and to finish His work. Jesus was passionate about allowing the Holy Spirit to lead Him, even if it meant going into the wilderness in Matthew 4.1 to be tempted by the devil. If you think I'm up for it, I'm going to go there. What are you saying to yourself that it is denying you of the possibility of where God wants to take you to show you how big He is in you? Come on, friends. we're not avoiding, we're showing reluctance. If we're not showing reluctance, we show procrastination. That's putting off stuff. You know, in 1 Kings chapter 1, the kingdom is going to hell because King David is 70 years of age and he's tucked up in bed and they look for a young maiden throughout all the land who can be his hot water bottle. And she cuddles up to David and it's like, it's so bad reading 1 Kings chapter 1 because Adonijah is exalting himself as the future king. David still had a responsibility. And here's what it says in 1 Kings 1.5. Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself saying, I will be king. And he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. And his father David had not rebuked him at any time by saying, why have you done so? He was also very good looking, just like Absalom. His mother bore him after Absalom. 
that spirit was still alive in the next generation. And because of David's procrastination, because of his passivity, we nearly lost the kingdom. And so Nathan the prophet comes and Bathsheba comes and the priest comes to David and says, what are you doing? Don't you realize what's going on? And he stirred himself. It's like this old man who's dying in bed stirred himself and he got up and he said, I'm not going to let this happen. And he began to revenge his disobedience. He put Solomon in place as the future king. But it could have been civil war. Do you realize in David's life there was civil war for seven years between the house of Judah and the house of Benjamin. And 10 tribes stood back and said, let's see how this plays out. So for seven years, David reigned over one tribe because 10 tribes were too scared to identify with the true king because the house of Saul was there. And it says in the Bible, the house of Saul got weaker and weaker. The house of David got stronger and stronger. And then after seven years, they finally said, okay, well, what are you putting off? putting off what are you just waiting for because it's going to cost you something here's the final one compromise how many times have you compromised in your life again we're going back to the apostle Peter and, and the reason I'm showing you all these great men in the Bible is, is I want you to feel in good company I don't want you to feel this morning that I'm pointing the finger at you because I'm not pointing the finger at you. I'm beckoning you. I'm saying, come on. Let's follow the Holy Spirit. Let's not resist Him. Let's allow Him to work in our lives. Let's allow Him to do what He wants to do. You know, there's one time I prayed a very dangerous prayer. Be careful if you ever pray this prayer. I said, Lord, I would like to be more generous. Could you make me more generous? That is a dumb prayer to pray unless you mean it. I mean, no, no sooner had the words come out of my mouth than I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, give away all the clothes you haven't worn for six months. And then I looked in my wardrobe and I had a little cry. And all my Tommy Hilfiger, my Adidas, my Levi's, I had worn for six months. There they all were. I was like, oh, I was, I was filling a suitcase. It was a big suitcase. I was filling it with clothes. And then I saw my two nice suits from when I was a little toddler. And here's, here was my rationale. Yeah, you wear those at weddings and funerals. I mean, you don't wear those all the time. Well, I did when I was a consultant. So I didn't give away the suit. I had the worst two weeks of my life. Like, I'm not kidding you. Like every, and I'm a senior lecturer in a Bible college. Can you believe it? It's like great man of God, teaching people the Bible, teaching leaders how to follow Jesus. And every time I opened that covered door, the Holy Spirit said, you asked, you asked, I answered, you asked. It's like, whoa. You can have a thousand reasons for why you don't give. You can tell yourself, well, you know, I come from a poor family. I come from a difficult situation. I'm on a low wage. And you know what? You just made it all about you and not about the treasure and not about the bigness of God. It's like, come on. Come on. Don't compromise. Galatians 2. This is Paul speaking. When Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. Can you believe it? It was a church that was one of the few churches that was a united church of Jew and Gentile. And Peter thought it was fantastic and he was eating with all the Gentiles and he's the guy who, who led the centurion, the Roman centurion to the Lord. He was the one who brought the gospels to non-Jews. And here he is now, under pressure, because of fear, separating himself. And so now you've got a separated church. Jews on one side, Gentiles on the other. 
And I think in America, you know a little bit about separation and how we make divides that God doesn't want to make. And Paul says, I stood in his face and told him he's wrong. He's compromised. What I'm trying to say to you is that the great men of God, Jeremy, Jeremiah, the apostle Peter, they all at some point resisted the Holy Spirit. So maybe you know someone in your world who has. I've got some. It says this. When King Saul was finally confronted by Samuel the prophet in 1 Samuel 15, 24, he said these words. I have sinned. He didn't kill the Amal- all the Amalekites. He preserved the king from death. I have sinned, for I have tra- transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people their voice. The reason we compromise is because we're people. And so it's a partial obedience. It's like we do something to save face, but it's not totally what God has said. So my invitation to us this morning is come on, friends. Let's not be people who resist the Holy Spirit. Let's not people who put up blocks. Let's not be people who are bored. Let's not be people who are reluctant. Let's not be people who procrastinate or who compromise. But let's be people who say yes. And let me tell you, when the Holy Spirit leads you into places, sometimes it's painful. It's extremely painful. I remember God asking God to just refine me. You know, when you pray a prayer like that, God starts to show you what you're like on the inside. It's like that can be get that can get really ugly. It's like how many of how many of you in the room want other people to know your darkness? It's like, oh, I got a bit of here. But the Holy Spirit has got a plan and a purpose to set you free, to bring you to a land that's a good land, a land flowing with milk and honey. But that journey means. You've got to go with Him. You've got to trust Him. It means sometimes you face a Red Sea. It means sometimes you face an Amalekite army. It means sometimes you face a place where there is no water. It means sometimes you you, you face a place where there is no food and you get manna from heaven. It means sometimes you face a walled city. It means sometimes you're facing obstacles because the enemy wants to block you. But the Holy Spirit wants you to see how big God is in your life if you will just keep saying so here's my final word to you. If you're here this morning and this message speaks to your heart and I'm not going to make you confess anything to me or out loud, but to God. And you know that one of those things has played in your life right now, but today you want to say to the Holy Spirit, I want to stop resisting, through, especially through passive resistance, especially through avoidance, through reluctance, through procrastination or compromise. I want to stop saying no in those ways. I don't want to say yes to you. Right where you are, in your seat. You don't have to come to the front. Just in your seat, right where you are. Stand to your feet. I want to pray for you. You're responding to God, not to me. He sees your heart. He knows your life. He knows your journey. He knows your struggle. He knows all the details. And He wants to do something for you this morning. And if you're at home watching this online, you can stand right where you are. It's an act of faith and response to the Holy Spirit speaking to you. I want to thank you for every single person that's standing here. I honor you. And I admire you. I admire your honesty. We're going to do some business right now with God. Holy Spirit, I thank you. I thank you for every single person standing in this room. I thank you that the cry of their heart is that like Jesus, they would say, not my will, but yours be done. And that's not an easy prayer to pray, Lord. That's not an easy prayer to pray when you're facing the cross. But I thank you that you're the God of resurrection. I thank you you're the God of breakthrough. I thank you you're the God of fulfilled promises. And I speak over every single life standing here today where every single person is yielding to you, Holy Spirit, in a brand new area of their lives. Lord, I ask that you would come and extend your hand of grace towards them. 
Your word says you give grace to the humble, you resist the proud. Let grace come to this act of humility in such a way that people are going to say, see a marked difference. Lord, let it come. And I pray that for every person in this room who's saying yes to you in a new way today, Lord Jesus, that they would have a testimony, that there would be a cry that rises up from this house. I did this and this is what the Lord did for me. I surrendered in this area and this is how he came through for me. And I ask that every testimony that is living and active in this house would encourage others to take that step too. And Lord, I just speak shalom and peace over every person in this place. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Friends, it's been such an honor to be with you. God bless you. Have a great day. Amen.